The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 10226 in the name of Cameron Buchanan on strategic planning in the Lothians. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Cameron Buchanan to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss strategic planning in the Lothians this evening. I would like to extend my thanks to those members who have added their support to the motion and allowed this issue to be debated. I realise that strategic planning is not a subject that exactly sets the heather alight. Indeed, I have seen eyes roll when I have mentioned it to my colleagues. However, when you begin to understand the planning system and the significance of the strategic city-based plans within that, then its importance is obvious. It profoundly affects how our communities, towns and ultimately Edinburgh will physically grow in future. Indeed, when I discuss planning with people, I come back to the point, well made by John Wilson on the Local Government Committee, who noted that most people view the planning system through the prism of their own individual experience with it. Specifically, they become aware of the wider planning system when a development is proposed within their community, and the questions they will invariably ask themselves are those who planned this and who approved it. And this is the crux of the planning system. These questions must be answered relatively straightforwardly, and that requires a transparent planning system where, where those making the key decisions can be held to account. The importance of the strategic plan is that it answers so many of these questions, if not in a straightforward or a transparent manner, along with our local development plans, which it also shapes. So the housing developments, retail parks and changes to our communities have their origins rooted in these documents. As such, their importance can hardly be overstated. As we have just finished the consultation exercise on the main issues which were contained in SES Plan 2, and as many local authorities are in the midst of drawing up a new local plan, now I think would be an op opportune moment to review how the strategic planning is working. As my motion suggests, the bedrock of a healthy system is community and grassroots participation in the process. And we cannot encourage enough of our community councils and other representative bodies to come forward and make themselves heard. However, that itself is not enough. I brought forward today's debate in order to air some of the issues and, frankly, frustrations which I've heard repeatedly by community councils and local authority councils across the Lothians and further afield. One of those which strikes at the heart of this transparency and accountability agenda, namely the development of housing land requirement by the Strategic Planning Authority and the use of housing needs and demand assessment. Of course, the most recent supplementary guidance sees a reduction of housing required from Edinburgh in the short term. Furthermore, I note with interest that there has been a renewed guidance, reviewed guidance for the conduct of the HNDA, issued, which was issued early this month. But for so many communities, this is a small step following persistent doubts about the integrity of the assessment being raised and the myriad of questions people have over the process. This is a huge cause of controversy due to the significant pressure it places on our greenfield sites and indeed the green belt the green belt with brownfield sites in the lothians identified in previous local development plans still lying undeveloped and with a significantly lower population than estimated leading to reduced local government and health board funding in the area it is easy to see where the frustration and doubts come from indeed i understand only last week representatives from the highly regarded coburn association which was established to promote co conservation in edinburgh called into question some of these figures with the planners from the city of edinburgh council and there appeared to be a concession from those same planners that the figures may be awry. We must have full confidence in the demand for housing land supply, particularly given that communities are being asked to give up valuable green space. And I would ask the Minister to commit this evening to reviewing these targets and their methodology, and above all, ensure that the process is transparent. He has until only tomorrow to comment on the updated land supply guidance, and he should take this opportunity to demand improvements. One site presently threatened is Curry Muirn Park, where almost 500 people have objected to the proposed development of it. Plans to invest in facilities for locals have been shelved in anticipation of the sites developing for housing, which raises the question, who, who do these locals hold responsible for housing supply figures? As matters stand, they're struggling to find anyone responsible. Presiding officer, when local councillors are challenged about the decisions in the local development plan, they point to the government, and when the public raises a matter with their MSP, they're told it's the fault of the all-powerful all strategic plan. As such, I would suggest that there is a strong feeling that these plans allow politicians to avoid the responsibility for tough decisions. I think it is perhaps time for these significant decisions, particularly around housing, to be formally debated in this parliament, so that we can be clear where all, we all stand on them, and so that the public can see who is taking the decisions, and above all, hold those people account accordingly. 
Put simply, we must really stop the blame game and stop politicians running away from their responsibilities. Which brings me to the issue of approval of our local plans. In Edinburgh, serious concerns over the infrastructure implications of several housing developments have been raised. Indeed, anyone who knows the level of congestion in the west of the city will understand the plight of residents in Camo who've taken the extraordinary step of threatening legal action against the city council. This response of the city's planning authority, sitting planning councillor Ian Perry, is more extraordinary still because it is to suggest that any delay to the development plan would put in danger all of Edinburgh's greenbelt green, green belt and greenfield sites, which is plainly nonsense. The residents of Camo and Edinburgh overall deserve a better choice than being told it's either a dud plan or uncontrolled and unfettered development on the, of the Greenbelt. There are profound questions about the suitability of the local development plan in terms of its implications or infrastructure. That being the case, we should have time to step back and reflect on whether it can be improved. Instead, we face the prospect of it being forced through in spite of these concerns, and I would ask the Minister to clarify whether he thinks such advice is appropriate in these circumstances. Presiding officer, accountability and transparency. These are the key aspects of an effective planning system. And in the development of the SES Plan 2, these two areas, I think, must be improved. But in the more immediate term, I think urgent action is needed. I would ask the Minister again to undertake to reject housing land supplementary guidance until we have confidence in its figures. I also look forward to his comments on the situation in Edinburgh particularly and hope his agreement that forcing through approval of a local development plan in such circumstance is in no way appropriate. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate and I ask members to ensure that they have pressed the request to speak buttons if they wish to participate. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Colin Keir. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, I want to congratulate Cameron Buchanan for getting us to debate this issue tonight. And I think some of the issues that he's mentioned are issues of concern to many, many people. Um, I've certainly been concerned about the issue about housing land and the priority of development and the order in which development takes place to the extent that I asked for a briefing from the City Council for all the relevant MPs and MSPs in the Lothians, and we had that meeting in January this year, and I think it was very useful, and I think one of the key challenges that was put in front of us was that when the previous local plan was uh, put in place, there was a presumption um, and an allocation of 18,000 houses in the Leith Ports area, and when that was removed by Leith Ports, it has created a real challenge for the city. So there's a real, real difficult issue at the heart of this um, agenda, which is that we need more houses in Edinburgh. We need more affordable houses for rent, for social use, um, for housing associations or council houses. But we also need more affordable housing to buy. And the lack of new provision and the fact that many houses have been taken out of general residential use and be used as short-term lets for the tourist industry means that we have a phenomenal pressure on housing. For those reasons, um, I'm very glad that we're able to debate this issue. I think there's a, a challenge that we may see increasing social polarisation as people in low and modest incomes or even um, relatively good incomes can't afford to buy property in the city because they don't qualify for social rented housing are either faced with um, the relatively high cost of rented accommodation or they have to leave the city and that's not good for us and uh, having previously lived in London I do worry about Edinburgh going in the same same route so I think more investment um, in social rented properties particularly on brownfield land is absolutely crucial and that has got to be one of the priorities in the, the new plan, uh, plan number two that's coming forward. Um, I very much support the Council's policy of 25% social rented on major developments. I think that becomes more important as housing is short, in short supply. And one issue we need to focus on is the different types of houses that are needed. It's not just the cost, it's the availability of the right kind of housing. And I see in my casework a lot, um, not just families who are looking for housing, but older people who can't afford the housing that's available at the moment. I also want to just finish on the issue of the challenge for house builders. The costs of development have gone up, the costs of banking finance has gone up, and that is a real challenge that runs through CES plan. It's referred to in the comments by the reporter's findings on the spatial strategy in CES plan, where he comments there will be challenges to the delivery of housing in the short term because of the uh, 
limited resources available for development and supporting infrastructure. So it's partly a challenge of development infrastructure from the Council and the lack of um, capital investment the Council has for new houses, new infrastructure, particularly transport infrastructure, but it's also an issue of finance for the development industry. And if you look at the housing land audit carried out last year, a key part of this story is the number of sites identified in the local plan that are not being taken forward. Uh, 12, 12 sites where the consent has expired. It was in the development plan. It was given planning permission, but the development wasn't taken forward. Um, local plan sites with no consent or activity on them. 16 sites where consent was actually given. The plan was in the local... The a uh, uh, site was in the local plan but it wasn't taken forward and 10 sites where the developer or the company went into administration. That is a key part of the story which needs to be part of tonight's debate. There are sites that were identified for development that are no longer being taken forward and I think in moving forward we've got to see those sites Questions have got to be asked about the capacity to develop those sites. They were the top priorities for the Council last time. There are massive implications for the loss of the fourth port sites, and that, I think, has led to the difficult situation the Council now faces. And I hope the Minister, in his summing up, will listen to the representations from the Council, but also, I suspect, for those of us around the room who are concerned about the lack of progress, both in Brownfield and approved sites in the last development plan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call Colin Keir to be followed by Anne McTaggart. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer, and could I congratulate Cameron Buchanan for bringing this forward uh, this evening. Uh, when it comes to the strategic plan and the effects of uh, the proposed local development plan, there is absolutely nothing that uh, uh, comes through my inbox more than this. It is the thing that we have to deal with in our constituency office. It is... I find myself in... I'll agreement with Cameron Buchanan in his opening statement, and there's much to what uh, Sarah Boyack has also said. In my constituency, we have a situation where, quite frankly, the consultation from the City of Edinburgh Council has been nothing short of abysmal. There's also a feeling that uh, deals have been done. The local people, particularly in Camo and Maybury, who has, has been mentioned already, have no faith in the process, simply because of the dismal way the City of Edinburgh Council has handed, uh, handled their objections. It was mentioned in an article in the Evening News by John McClellan the other day there that um, something like a quarter of the total amount of objections to the, uh, uh, the local development plan is set deal with western part of Edinburgh. That is because the traffic situation, particularly in the environmental situation, is dire. Queensferry Road uh, corridor, particularly at Barrington, and the Kerstorfen Road corridor, particularly at Maybury and on St John's Road, are some of the most polluted areas in the UK. And yet, some planner has decided in the main issues report that it would be a great idea to, despite the fact there are fields, plenty of space for development, absolutely no plans to put forward an idea of how the infrastructure actually uh, supports this development, not just within the, uh, uh, those particular areas, but along the corridors of the two busiest roads in Edinburgh. So I, I feel I have to support my constituents here. It, for many, many years, there have been talk about uh, uh, the transport and pollution problems in these areas, and still, despite uh, various questions and plans which come from Newbridge to Maybury, but no further, and the only thing that we generally hear, a very common thing, is don't worry about it. The tram will deal with that. Well, the tram won't deal with that. The transport assessments are such that they are, quite frankly, unbelievable on the grounds of the fact that they say they can mitigate against uh, future growth in traffic, when, in fact, the problem is here right now. And I do hope the Minister listens to this. Now, I know the City Council has a very... A difficult decision to make. There are nobody's denying that there is a, a housing shortage in the area, but you cannot just dump houses down and hope the roads will supply uh, or uh, be able to support the amount of traffic that goes through them. Maybury and Camel uh, East Craigs, which is in a shocking position, where it actually has only one road out, and that's onto Maybury Road, which has two uh, of the busiest junctions at Camel and uh, Barrington and uh, Maybury. 
And really, the City Council has done nothing in terms of trying to discuss the problems with these people and come up with, pro uh, with solutions. We've held public meetings in terms of strategic planning. Nobody believes uh, down there because they just feel as if they are way off the mark with uh, information that's come back. And I would uh, really make a plea to the City of Edinburgh Council to start getting their act together in terms of the work that they have to do to convince the people that the houses that are required can go into these places. Queensferry is another area. They've just been told we're going to throw another 1,000 houses down there. No consultation with them. Absolutely abysmal. And before I carry on and get into other uh, degrees, probably uh, problems with my own uh, council colleagues, I would just say once again that there are difficulties. Cameron Buchanan has brought them up. And I do appreciate Sarah Boyack's efforts here uh, with putting together that meeting. But as was pointed out, at the, or people saw at the meeting, the convener, unfortunately, didn't have any, uh, any real answers. That was the difficulty, and that's what we are facing. So I'll end there. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to contribute towards tonight's debate on the importance of local government, local development plans. And I sincerely congratulate Cameron Buchanan on securing this time in the Chamber to consider the important issues raised by the second South East Scotland Strategic Development Plan. As a Glasgow MSP, I have no direct um, association with the work of the South East Scotland or its associated local authority areas. However, I understand the importance of a coherent planning system across the regions of Scotland and I have previously enjoyed learning about the work of Glasgow and Clyde Valley Strategic Development Plan area. And we've done that within the Local Government and Regeneration Committee that we both sit on. Although these regional bodies and the work they carry out may initially appear far removed from our everyday lives, the effect of the decisions they take cannot be underestimated. Strategic development plans will inform future planning applications and will be instrumental in creating the kind of towns and city centres that we all want to see and live in. Whilst the context of each of these regional plans will vary, the existence of a strategic approach to planning will help to move forward a number of shared aims. For example, we share a common commitment to increasing the availability of affordable housing, which has just been mentioned in the priors and the speaker before me, particularly around our largest cities. This plan will allow for that aspiration to be realised through designating the geographical zones that each local authority should allocate for future building projects. This will fight against the continuing price rises in urban and city centre areas and will allow families on lower incomes to live nearer the places that they work. These plans also allow key public bodies to work together at the earliest stages of town planning. Our transport, waste, water and energy infrastructure will also be covered by these strategic plans as well the promotion of green belts and networks. Presiding officer, we must ensure that our local community groups alongside our local national and public bodies are consulted at the earliest stage of the planning process. And I am confident that through meaningful engagement in all of our planning areas, we can create the kind of Scotland we all want to see. Thank you. Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Alison Johnston. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also thank Cameron Buchanan for securing this debate. There are lessons arising from the development of the local LDPs and CES plan, but we need to remember that they arise because Edinburgh is one of the economic powerhouses of not only Scotland, but of the UK. People are attracted here because of employment opportunities and the quality of, a li or, and quality of life. As a result, there is unmet demand for housing in and around the Edinburgh area. This is not just as a result of an increasing population, but due to the growth of single adult households. The responsibility of local authorities throughout the Lothians is to calculate the demand for housing in their areas. Councils then have a duty to allocate sufficient land 
to meet the demand that they have identified. This then forms a local development plan and that in turn feeds into the CES plan. The problem lies, presiding officer, in identifying sufficient and suitable land within the city boundary for meeting the demand for housing. Now, there are a number of issues for Edinburgh in general and the west of the city in particular that should, I believe, be considered by councillors and local authority officials before allocating land. Traffic congestion. At peak times, is a major issue, particularly in the west of the city. Data supplied by a leading, a leading sat-nav company places Edinburgh as the third most congested city in the UK. Estimated journey times are on average 34% longer, rising to 60% more than usual during the morning rush hour. This will only get worse as thousands of new homes already approved are built in West Lothian and the Fife areas all commutable into Edinburgh. Councillors need to answer how the road network will cope with further increases in traffic before deciding whether to build in the west of the city. As a result, we have poor air quality in and around the four main arterial routes into the west of the city. Of the four routes, Queensferry Road, Glasgow Road, Gorgie Road regularly fail the EU air quality standard, with the Lanark Road recording increasing levels of pollutants. This is an issue I have raised before and I continue to believe that if Edinburgh councillors accept the revised LDP proposed by officials, they could be adding to the problem with the resultant reduction in the quality of life for residents living close to these roads. If Edinburgh councillors are looking after the best interests of residents in the west of the city, they should ensure that they comply with Scottish planning policy ensuring that housing is built on brownfield land first and greenbelt land last, if at all. In my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, some of the land identified in the Edinburgh LDP is agricultural land. Scotland is rightly proud to be one of the few countries to be able to feed itself. However, we cannot continue to lose good quality arable land to developers when brownfield sites continue to exist. And I appreciate the list that Sarah Boyat read out of all of the um, brownfield sites that have not been developed on, um, because it suits developers to build in greenfield sites where they've got lower costs of development and have a price premium because it's a nice leafy suburb. The Council also has to deal with the issue of empty homes in the capital that was estimated recently at 4,300. The employment of an empty homes officer announced recently needs to help owners to bring these properties back into use as a matter of urgency. Finally, presiding officer, the Scottish Government has invested he heavily in the Airdrie Bathgate line and the new Borders Railway. Should planning policy not encourage councils out with the CES plan area to build new homes to take advantage of these commuter routes, rather than replicating the problems of our other capital city. Many thanks. I now call Alison Johnston to be followed by Chick Brodie. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Our towns and cities are where we live and the way they're designed and built has a profound effect on our lives. People want to live in nice places that provide a community with good quality housing and connections to local shops, green spaces, libraries and other things. One person's idea of a good place to live will be different from another's. But these are some basic entry level things that planning should be delivering. Land use planning is a profession for a reason. It's a difficult art to balance all the demands on our land, particularly when you're not in control of the building itself. But just because it's a profession doesn't mean the experts have all the answers. Far from it. Land use planning should be done by people who live there. We shouldn't be frightened of opening up this kind of decision making. Of course, architects and developers have an important role in this but so do the people who will live in and alongside their houses. And what's holding us back from a step change in public engagement? The organisations Involve and the RSA published From Fairy Tale to Reality, a report dispelling the myths around citizen engagement. These myths trap us in a way of thinking that says public engagement is too expensive, it's too difficult, people aren't up for it. The report has myth-busting examples from around the world of engagement which works. Land use planning is always going to be political and contested, so we shouldn't run away from that. 
I congratulate Cameron Buchanan for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Cameron Buchanan has identified the most contested part of the current CES plan, and things are moving very fast in Edinburgh Council this week as a result. But does anyone genuinely believe that 107,000 new homes are required in South East Scotland over the, last, over the next 10 years? It has taken 300 years to reach the 500,000 households or so that we have at present. And in community meetings across my region, these unrealistic housing targets have come up time after time. People see land already zoned for housing in the hands of developers left untouched. Housing targets from the CES plan mean more land is to be zoned, and these targets are bloated by a 10% generosity margin. Take away the fact and the generosity and the need to sacrifice the Greenbelt at Camo and Curry Muir End, for example, vanishes. People are understandably incredulous and often angry that their views are ignored and estimated housing numbers from a desktop study, study are given precedence. Edinburgh does need more homes, but the spread of the suburbs and executive housing isn't going to meet those needs. How many homeless people or people in housing need will get new homes in David Murray's garden district? The local authority is blaming the government while the government is pinning it on the local authority. At the end of last year, I asked the planning minister during oral questions on the 12th of December what role local authorities have in determining appropriate housing land supply. He replied to say that the numbers are set by the local authority. This is true to an extent, but the housing forecasts are done with a government tool and signed off as credible by the government. The government do have the last word and they're enforcing it. But this creates a local development plan that meets the needs of developers, not real people's housing needs, and that's the issue here. I'm sure the minister understands that the argument mo that more new supplies will reduce house prices is nonsense, because new supply is only a fraction of overall supply, and it makes very little difference to price. Indeed, the evidence is the opposite over the last cycle. When supply was at its highest, prices were greatest. What CES Plan 2 needs to do is deliver housing that meets the needs of people, not developers. There are thousands, as Gordon MacDonald has pointed out, thousands of long-term empty homes in the capital. That needs to change, and Edinburgh is lagging behind other councils on this. Brownfield sites earmarked for housing need to be used for housing. Examples at Cheshire, Knox Gangs, where housing land has been given over to large-scale retail should not happen, given the housing need. Finally, presiding officer, the government should recognise that any forecast comes with a health warning. It shouldn't be set in stone. We need to be guided by reality and aim to build the kind of homes which work for people in the greatest housing need. Those that build on existing networks, social networks, where services like shops, schools, surgeries, community centres and public transport are more viable. Thank you. Many thanks. Chick Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> As a member for the South of Scotland, which includes East Lothian, may I also add my thanks to Cameron Buchanan for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Mr Brodie, could you lift your no, microphone up, please? Uh, the South East of Scotland population is approximately 1.2 million and is forecast to grow to around 1.4 million by 2031. The constituent authorities recently set out their vision for the South, South East of Scotland, I quote, it being the main growth area and a key driver of the Scottish economy. Edinburgh, a leading European city, is of course at its heart, a capital city which is the hub of the regional economy. The SES plan for 2032 sets an objective that the Edinburgh city region become a healthier, more prosperous and sustainable place of outstanding international recognition. The plan, of course, considers housing, transport, employment, land supply, strategic employment sites and, of course, our town centres. A plan to accommodate a growing population with a demand for 107,000 houses to be built across the area by 2024 and an additional 48,000 uh, houses between 2024 to 2032. Now, while Edinburgh is the hub and the heart, congested though it may be, the energy comes and will come from local communities for which a sense of place and identity are paramount, like East Lothian. Maintaining the community identity is, a key, is key, while each develops opportunities and strengths that new communication and social links with neighbouring communities bring. Investment in transport links in the Borders Railway and in local rail links, again in East Lothian, creates a, a movable social network that aids and abets a growing population 
connect with places of work. Presiding officer, passenger growth in the plan area continues to grow and we need to ensure our transport can accommodate this growth, albeit a transport system that also embraces our climate change targets. Strategic employment sites of around 1,000 hectares and deployment of same have to go hand in hand with land for housing to achieve that objective also. Growth in the region, strategic growth, will be achieved by an even spread of development uh, so that the constituent authorities around the region share in the stated aim of the plan that the area is, quote, internationally recognised as an outstanding area in which to live, work and do. The plan is an opportunity to create viable business opportunities close to areas of population. It's an opportunity for, for universities and colleges to work with local communities and employers. The Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce was tasked with making recommendations to ensure Scotland produces better qualified, work-ready and motivated young people with skills relevant to modern employment opportunities, both as the employees and the entrepreneurs of the future. This is a challenge to our education system and to business and industry, which must become more actively engaged in youth employment and education and provide quality employment opportunities in the area to a lot more young people. In developing new communities and growing others, we might ensure that there are opportunities for mixed use development to bring job opportunities closer to the communities and to home. The Strategic Development Plan supports the development of a range of marketable sites of the size and quality to meet the requirements of business and industry within the area. And so, Presiding Officer, I wish to conclude by looking at one such opportunity which has arisen in East Lothian. Kakenzie Power Station in East Lothian closed in March 2013 after 45 years of producing power for Scotland. I believe plans for developing the site are proceeding and these plans embrace all interested parties. The options for the potential redevelopment of the decommissioned Kakenzie Power Station site are many. It is envisaged that there might be an energy park which might become a major hub with a wider fourth Tay renewable energy cluster and other locations to serve the needs of the offshore wind market in particular. It also has other possibilities to serve the freight and leisure markets to accommodate Scotland's fast-growing export markets and its tourism activities. Finally, Presiding Officer, such a development, properly developed and with local consultation, provides a real opportunity to create sustainable employment in East Lothian, bringing highly skilled jobs in engineering and hospitality, for example, and backed by the excellence of our schools, our college and our universities. In closing, presiding officer, opportunities such as Kakenzie, and it is not the only one, allow for the development of a fully integrated regional community, working as a team, travelling as a team, learning as a team and winning as a team. Many thanks. Can I now invite Derek Mackay to respond to the debate, Minister, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and it's quite appropriate that I, as Planning Minister, respond on behalf of the Government, but I hope that members will also appreciate there are some constraints on what I can say because of live and current uh, planning matters, so in some respects I'll speak in uh, general terms. But I do believe it's important that the planning system is indeed plan-led. Back in January, when I presented the proposed national planning framework and a position statement on the review of Scottish planning policy to Parliament, I emphasised the four priorities for the planning system being performance, simplicity, a plan-led system and delivery on the ground. And the third national planning framework and revised SPP are coming to fruition after a period of active engagement across a very wide range of interests. I will launch both documents next week. Both the MPF3 and SPP help to provide a clear national vision and I want development plans to do the same and provide clarity and confidence to developers and communities at the strategic and local levels. For the four city regions in their strategic development plans, the challenges are increased by the need to work across local authority boundaries. But that doesn't mean uh, that they're not resolvable because there are some very challenging uh, issues. Once the first round of the new SDPs were in place, I was very keen to review the effectiveness of the arrangements and ensure that the strategic development plans were fit for purpose. So there's been a strategic development plan review carried out by Kevin Murray Associates in Glasgow University. It's now complete and I will also announce our next steps on that review next week. While the review has found that the arrangements are not broken, nor are they fully optimised, 
Now here with the second largest projection of population and household growth in Scotland, related infrastructure constraints and a sensitive landscape within which to find new locations for development, there are clearly and undoubtedly pressures in the, in the circumstances that are presented. But other areas have shown that the arrangements can and do work. Its plan and the other SDPAs were created to take the lead on planning for growth and development of each city region. This means delivering and making a difference for communities on the difficult strategic issues and that doing that in a timely way, if this doesn't happen, then the SDPs uh, lose their relevance and create additional problems within the planning system. Uh, delivering effective plans can only be achieved through effective engagement, uh, the sooner the better and as early as possible, to identify and prioritise the issues and then to work closely with the delivery bodies to resolve them. So what is it that says plan is planning for. Let us be clear that it is not a centrally imposed housing figure. As with other areas, CES plan was required by Scottish planning policy to prepare a housing need and demand assessment, HNDA, and agree its own housing supply target, working with the relevant housing and planning interests. The HNDA forms part of the evidence base for the housing supply target, sometimes referred to as a housing requirement in the plan, but importantly, they should also take into account wider economic, social and environmental factors in order to arrive at the amount of land required for new homes. And of course, identification of sites with early community engagement um, is to be encouraged. But unfortunately, when CES plan was submitted to ministers for examination, Although it set out an overall housing requirement, it did not show how that requirement would be distributed across the six constituent authorities. Without it, it would not have been clear what the individual authorities would be planning for. It, would it be an equal split or would it be effectively planned on the basis of need, capacity and other constraints, which is surely the, the basis of proper strategic planning? When I approved CES plan last summer, I therefore accepted the reporter's recommendations that supplementary guidance must be prepared within 12 months to set out how the requirement would be distributed. That guidance is now with me and I hope to issue a decision on that shortly. This will provide clarity for planning authorities in taking forward their own local development plans, giving communities the opportunity to engage fully on where this needed development should be located. So, To conclude, development plans are at the heart of an effective planning system. And strategic development plans provide the steer for over half of all Scotland's local development plans. In the case of the Lothians and not forgetting Fife and Scottish borders, CES plan must engage effectively with its interests in the broadest sense and produce a plan that all parties can have faith in. It needs to provide clarity and confidence around the resolution of key challenges facing the area. And crucially, it needs to add value and make a difference to the local development plans that follow uh, and, uh, to the, for, and for the communities for which it is indeed planning. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Cameron Buchanan's debate on strategic planning in the Lothians. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.